Water, of course, is an integral part of how the city or this place has been developing and, and is going to be developed in the future. I worked a lot with, uh, I don't know if you know this, Jean Tubanians. So we worked a lot together as far as water conservation was concerned. We really wanted to know in detail what is going on with the water when it rains. Into which water bodies does it flow, which water bodies were, f were getting filled very fast, which, which one didn't get filled at all, in which direction was the water flowing. You know, some was flowing directly to the sea, other water was stagnant, other water was flowing in different direction. So we checked all that out. Whenever it was raining, and for us, it couldn't rain hard enough. We were out in the rain and checking what is going on, where is the water flowing, what does it do, what erosion was being created, and what erosion could have been prevented. So all this stuff, like, I think we were probably the most intensive people at that time in Orville who did this kind of work. And uh, Jean, he, he went on and he, he, uh, uh, he did a lot of water conservation in his area. And uh, I did also water conservation already at that time on this uh, Swami area land. I somehow had an agreement that on that land I could also do water conservation and it worked out uh, quite well. So then in, uh, in 1990, uh, I, um, there was a change in my, in, in my life and um, I, I wanted to apply my knowledge that I had in land use and water conservation on village land. Because uh, my idea was that uh, unless we apply that what we know uh, on as much land as possible around us, uh, there's not much uh, point uh, in doing that because the Orville area itself is relatively small. But the area that is needed in order to have a region of some meaning is much larger. So, so I had some very large projects with the central government for about 10 years. And in these 10 years I worked in a large circle around Orville. Uh, and we, we bonded and made small dams uh, and columns uh, on, on uh, I think, three or four thousand acres of village land. And that was very successful and we planted more than two million trees and uh, planted uh, hundreds of kilos of seeds direct by direct sowing and uh, wherever there was village land and wherever villagers wanted to participate in the project we, we worked and we planted. The tank rehabilitation that we did in the villages uh, it, was, uh, it was like this, there was an idea I believe that I have the capacity, after doing all this work in the villages on a smaller scale, where I dug small ponds and made earth buns and all these kind of things, I believe that if I go one step further or several steps further and do a large body of water like this, what are called tanks, which are used for irrigation and which have hundreds of hectares of area and enormous water storage that is there, we, we saw that there was an, these tanks, uh, which were there since the Chola period, they had never been desilted properly. Yeah? Because you need a lot of knowledge, you need a lot of machinery, you need a lot of money to do that. And you can't just go with a few chattis and with a wheelbarrow and take the soil. You have to do something drastic because this is hundreds of years of silt that is there. But if you do it successfully, then you make all of a sudden also a lot more water available for the villagers to grow more food. So that is their sustenance, that is their security, water. So we got this grant from the, what is called, Indo-Canadian Environment Facility. And it was about um, uh, 11, 12 cores, which equaled about two or three Canadian million dollars. And uh, so, in order to do the work on the land, the villagers had to participate with 30% of the, 
of their own funds. And they agreed to that and they had a village internal process whereby they actually managed to come up with these resources. And this area where we did that and this area where people came up with these resources is one of the poorest areas in the whole country. Yeah? Which means it can be done. And then we had a we had a group of people who you know uh, Grimium and the Federation, where all the people, the heads of the villages and the farmers, they came and we worked together. We talked together like this. It's been a very long involvement and very long journey. Um, it started nearly in the beginning when uh, we came and settled ourselves in Oroville. I was asked in 78 or 79 to take up the coordination of drilling wells for Oroville. An involvement with water uh, which has never actually stopped. It's been ongoing in different sectors of water, but it's been ongoing. It shifted from uh, drilling wells to uh, doing water management on the land, bonding, afforestation, then it shifted to wastewater, then um, it expanded um, according to the interest, the passion and the needs of the Oroville community. I'm still uh, deeply involved in wastewater, but uh, the interest went much wider in uh, water resource management. The main objective I've been trying to do was to prevent the runoff from the rainwater through the canyons into the sea. That was the first thing I did uh, to uh, yeah, ensure that it stays in the Oroville Plateau and not runs out in the sea. In 97 I saw the first uh, monsoon here and the sea was bleeding, so there was also a lot of erosion. So it was either uh, both preventing the erosion and preventing the runoff. I saw the monsoon 97, which was a very good monsoon and, and I didn't know what was happening because when you look from the rooftop, you see everything is nicely green. So I saw the job was done and of course a lot was done, but when you have the torrential rains, then bunch breaks, everything starts running and finally ends up in the canyons and then uh, into the sea. Because of all the dams and from Sukhavati up to Bomia Palian, there are about 30 and this whole canyon became uh, nicely grown with uh, all kinds of plants and trees and shrubs. Before you could walk through it, now only the big canyon is left over. I once have been funded for a part by uh, Stichting Desire, that was the first year. And then I worked with Harvest, with Tom, and for every one rupee the government would put in three rupees. So then I had uh, a lot of money, but normally I just put in money I get and some friends and family gave me donations. So I just work according to the money I had. Which was good because it didn't move too fast and you had time to think, to observe and to see how it works. I started in the, the big canyon here, the utility canyon. Uh, when that was uh, started, I started at the same time in the Aspiration Canyon, then the Oro Model Canyon. Then I went fully from uh, Bomia Palian to Sukhavati, so I checked all the check dams. And wherever I felt uh, one could be raised, I raised it. And that has always, you have to observe in the monsoon. Uh, so if one was overflowing too much, then again the next year I would raise a check dam maybe another 50 centimeters. Then I was asked to do work in Southern Forest by Aviram, who just came there. So I did uh, a lot of work there. Uh, in the beginning I already saw a lot of runoff from the international zone, but uh, the development group said don't touch the international zone that time. So I was sad to see how much runoff was there. Uh, that is very difficult area because it has clay 
doesn't percolate, so quickly it ran off. Then uh, I was asked to do some work there for one week. I got so many requests from like Tibetan Pavilion, International House, and that it became three weeks. So since then, maybe now seven years ago, every year I work also there. Because that is still a place where there is a lot of runoff. If you have 100 mm, then uh, all the water bodies are full and flowing into the Irumbai tank. So I was hoping I could uh, make that first big one bigger and deeper, but I didn't get the permission. Everybody is now <laughs> involved. Then I was asked to do work in Hermitage. That took several years. Where I made about 24 big ponds and dams. Deep Adaptation Oroville is a collective of people exploring how the scale of environmental and social disruption that might come through climate change points to an inevitable collapse of natural and social systems. Um, probable catastrophes in extreme weather through drought, famine, war, potentially, and even facing the possibility that the scale of change might make the planet so hostile that humans go extinct along with many other species. I think the Deep Adaptation Group tries to hold a space for confronting the frightening and uncertain kind of futures and um, the probabilities that face us um, and invites us to reclaim some of the things which are really precious and um, fundamental elements of our lives. Um, and one of those is a water supply <laughs> that we can rely on and that can feed the crops that we need. The issue in Oroville is often that we have the ideas, but we don't necessarily have the foundation to work out those ideas or this specific. If we set ourselves for a goal, usually you have to start with the bottom, the foundation. And that was also the case for the water. We did quite a lot in water management and water resource management. We built dams in the community. We did wastewater treatment plants. But when we looked a little bit closer, we found, for example, that um, there was no proper map of Oroville. There was no account of uh, how many wells we were operating. There was no data on uh, how much water we consume. There was no um, proper map on where the water lines were going and things like that. So these are actually, if you look at it on a white board, these are we have been able to concentrate and do quite good work on certain small areas. But the integration of that whole white thing, which is called water, the different puzzle pieces are often not either not put together, not put together, or pieces, data are missing, just missing. And then when you want to go for an implementation which, is, uh, which would help the overall situation, you have to do estimates, you have to do guesswork, and the community is not behind because it's not, um, it's not solid. It's not a solid thing. I mean, we miss things. So that's been ongoing. It's an ongoing effort. It's not only CSR, there are many people who are involved in that work, luckily. Um, the difficulty there, I think, is that we are divided. And that when we come to words, you know, when we more clearly see which direction we have to go, and the vision becomes a little bit more pronounced, more the zooming is much clearer. Um, it's essential that we come together 
And that's something that is at the moment sadly absent. We work in individual capacities, we work as a unit, but we seem to be <laughs> unable to come and understand and make a common effort to move together to something to realize. If you want to do a, a, a realize a, bigger, a big project, you have to agree. You all have to agree and uh, make sure that everybody, everybody pulls on the same rope. It's not yet there. Yet. It's not that we miss knowledge. It's not that we miss expertise or skill. We have so much creativity within the community, but we, you know, if, if we want to realize something, the, the, the main thing is come together. And that, reali uh, that realization or that effort to achieve something collectively, uh, trying collectively, if we are not together, if the pieces don't fall together, I think the result will not be visible for a long time. These are the challenges. Ignorance, unwillingness, human, hum, human qualities, which instead of on the positive side are on the negative side. We battle that one. <laughs> we battle... The outside is... Um, <coughs> confronted with these problems, Orville is no exception, and we are also confronted with these problems, ego, ambition, um, name it, it's all there. Ah, in the beginning, uh, working on Perenbalk land was the main challenge. Initially, I had a lot of uh, support from Panciat, Talsida was not in there yet, they came later. But nowadays, whenever you work on a public place, anybody can stop you. And uh, yeah, most, mostly I have been very supportive, but there are always people who don't want it. Even that time when I started in the Kenyan, some said, uh, don't touch the Kenyan. Well, I won't mess it up. Actually, the Kenyans improved a lot. The problem is, of course, uh, the rains are not bad, actually. We have an average of uh, one meter point three a year, which should be enough, but the problem is more water is taken out from the aquifer than it comes in. Although we get this uh, one meter point three every year in an average, uh, the aquifer is going down, so we have to do more. I'm a bit hopeful and I hope uh, again for a good monsoon. Climate change here, I hope we'll get more rains. But of course, uh, we never know. Uh, the weather pattern has been very irregular, uh, and you only know a certain thing if you have statistics for many years. So, how it is going to happen, we don't know yet. But this monsoon, uh, the southwest monsoon for the rest of India, has been very uh, abundant. There's a lot of rain. It's always scary, of course, because also you get uh, floods and landslides and, and these kind of things. But at least there was enough water. So the agricultural part has been increased again this year. They planted more rice, more grains, and that is hopeful. On the other hand, if you get a long drought, like last year, eight months, you're again also afraid for fires like in California and elsewhere. Uh, like in the international zone, I've been recently cleaning up again. Water bodies get silted in, sometimes plants, uh, trees are growing in it. If you want it to be functional, you have to maintain it. There were Orvillians and also Orville authorities, they were telling me, why are you working on village land? Uh, this priority is in Orville, you come for Orville, no? And I said, uh, yes, but I have my, by now, I have my own idea of what I believe all the could and should be, and that is including everybody around us. And uh, so, you know, some people, they think, oh, this guy is crazy, and uh, some people, they slowly began to understand, except for some, in some places in the Greenbelt, water conservation in Orville, it has never been really taken seriously. In fact, uh, people started to use more water, more and more wells were being drilled, and more and more water was being used. 
then water that was being recharged. There was a disparity in these things. And uh, no matter what you tell people, uh, when it comes to all the city planning and land use and whatever, uh, people have their own ideas. So many research has been done in Orville area and it has been realized that there is a scarcity of water. But still people are not taking it as on face value. They still think it, it goes on like this. And then when it comes really to the crunch, when they really see that yes, even the scientific explanations of why the water is getting less are there for everybody to see, then they come up with saying, no, no, mother wants us to do this, and mother will, you know, look after it. I mean, that's a bit too simplistic. That really, in Orville, this uh, this has never been this has never been solved. This this uh, this question of what are we actually doing with the water? Most of all, the attitude towards water has been always very Orocentric. The bioregion already faces a a water, a fresh water crisis and severe flood risks at the same time. On one side we don't have enough water and the other side we don't manage the water that we get through heavy rains. And the situation, even though it's bad today, is projected to get worse over the years and decades. So I guess the relationship is about how do we as individuals, as a community, recognising our interconnectedness can address the water issue and learn through that process. I'd say the main challenges are human ones. They're not practical ones, really. Um, they're challenges of denial, false or unexamined assumptions that we have, self-importance, poor communication, a lack of cohesion. And it's these very human things. It's not about the water, actually. That's how, that's how I see it. Somehow we can't get even the experts, the stakeholders that we have in Oroville to sit together and say, let's not run out of water, despite the excellence that we have, despite the expertise, the experience, and the amazing work that has gone on in Oroville. There is a gap somehow. There is the, the fundamental layer, the real implementation that needs to be more consistent. That's what I see. Because one of the most challenging things is the the rate of change that we are likely to face over the next century and the scale of that change is going to be too much for what our normal ways of working and our normal ways of life can cope with. Um, the drought, the flood, it's going to be much worse than we've ex experienced before. Good monsoon, good rains. I think uh, it needs a really rigorous uh, integral uh, approach. That means the wastewater which comes uh, uh, has to be maybe recycled again. Roofs needed to be implemented for harvesting the rainwater and being caught that it doesn't go in the ground uh, in the city centre but in reservoirs. Uh, probably we need also a desalination plant, which might be very difficult, but that's the only way uh, in the future probably to uh, see that we have enough water. And of course, it's not only Oroville, it is the bioregion, and uh, they will suffer also. So, yeah. If you can give a good example, but of course, it's very costly. Not running out of fresh water would be a great place to start, I think. And not having lives and property destroyed by avoidable floods. If we know we have flood risk, we should be addressing it. We shouldn't be letting it go on. We shouldn't be making it worse. So not running out of water and not allowing destruction to happen when we can change it. The water group, which I'm part of since six years, um, actually helped to focus what had to be done. And then, of course, the dreams, yes, of course, we all have dreams, but the task that I would like to see towards a more clearer direction is that we are able to produce for Oroville a kind of an overall water resource management plan, which would um, be able to um, 
I think the first step is there. We pinpointed out to the community that be careful because our aquifers are not replenishing, they're going down. So if we want to build the city which we dream of or the activities that we dream of, water, energy are necessities. The issue is what is there as an alternative. And then we enter that very difficult field of implementation and going into reality. I mean, we will have to change certain things, we will have to put money aside, resources, we have to agree. And that's a little bit of the dream to try to initiate, to help the community aware not just the individuals who are busy with water, we, we know, but we will have to make that step towards a common decision or acceptance decision or ac acceptance that we have to move towards, to add that those other resources, water resources, because the one that we're using is not sufficient. So that's kind of a, a hope, a dream. If that could come together, I think we managed quite a bit, quite a bit. I mean, water can, can figure in your dreams and, and water is, is an element which is like maybe the most magical. Uh, I mean, air and, and fire, they're also magical, but water has a, what, if you don't have water, you don't have life. When people go to the moon or try to explore other planets, the first thing they look at for is water. So water is the source of life in general and water has been worshipped since forever. Right? And uh, uh, in fact, uh, the, entire, the entire Indian philosophies of, of the Vedas and all these kind of things, they are all built on natural processes of it, which water is the most elementary. So if there is no water, there, is no, there are no people. And if there are no people, there is no development in any way. So um, you, can, uh, you can dream about water, but mostly water dreams about you. Yeah? If you if you are gentle with water and if you if you harvest it and if you don't overuse it uh, and uh, then you can do lots of things that you thought were not possible so the real opportunity i think is about that process of learning of transforming ourselves and learning how to change um, and the recognition of our inter interdependence and our equality. Um, water is a, a great binding topic for that, but um, somehow we need to do the learning at the same time because we don't have the benefits of time, really. We have to address the issue and we have to learn whilst we're going along. That's the reality I think we face. But somehow we haven't shifted our relationship with water. We still pollute it, we still overuse it. We don't respect it. We don't have a conscious relationship with water. Um, so there needs to be some kind of change there in ourselves and in the way we relate to each other, not just in Oroville, but with our neighbours who we share the water with. Addressing farming practices, design and construction standards, um, emergency planning, flood risk management, community-led initiatives, adapting traditional practices, and many, many other things that need to happen. But they need to happen somehow in a coordinated way and to build in that learning, to build in that, um, that growth and cohesion that can happen when you say we're facing an issue, we come together, we realize that we have to work together and we learn through that process. And there's also a role for individuals, of course. Um, I'm not really talking about watering your garden or how you water your garden or what plants you have, but seeing how your sphere of influence, your areas of work, your interests, your time is spent and how that relates to your 
to your values, to what you think is important. Um, I've been really inspired by another Deep Adaptation member who, in their professional work, dealing with huge projects, came to the point, reading Jen Bender's article about um, climate change and his analysis of why we need a deep adaptation, that they would only offer their services and their expertise to groups that would commit to significant mitigation and adaptation to climate change in the projects. They weren't going to just offer their services to people who weren't serious about that issue. And so that's uh, maybe it's not representative, but it demonstrates that we have choices. We have the ability to set our own standards and live by them um, to make sure that our, our actions really are aligned with what we believe when we are in that space and we're centered and we really see some of the challenges and some of our hopes and, and um, yeah, to live by that more, more fully. At the moment, there seems to be a positive kind of momentum in Orville that I see on one side. There's always challenges, of course, but um, with groups like Calling the Future, Prosperity, Citizens Assembly, um, the Deep Adaptation Group, I think there's, there is a, a shift and a momentum towards addressing some of these issues that we're facing, water being a key one. Um, so I guess let's make sure we don't lose that momentum. Um, let's all of us who are, are interested, let's come to the table, let's have a conversation, let's find a workable vision, let's find our overlaps and make it happen. Let's, let's just get started, let's talk. Um, let's address these human issues that are there and not just ignore them or say that they're too difficult because we can't afford to think like that. We have to work together. We have to find a positive way forward. Um, so I would just highlight that there is this sense at the moment and by tackling the water security issue, there's an opportunity not just to deal with that issue but to go on a deeper learning process about the, the change at an individual, at a community, at a regional level that we will need to do not just for water but for food and other challenges because of climate change and other social issues that are in the world. It's kind of simple. If we run out of water, then we're going to struggle to do anything else. So we involved the farmers from bottom up in everything that was going on. And if you do that, then people are happy and they participate. Whenever I was asked by, by individuals or groups uh, to give my opinion or to help out with, with matters concerning water, I have done that. And I will also do that in the future. But I'm under no illusion uh, to impose myself or go to some group and, and waste my time in doing something which I have seen. It's not really, it's, it's not really the right way to, to go about it. And so I, whatever I feel needs to be done, I raise the funds and I do it myself. And if I raise the water table in many places, then it is there forever. It's not for me. It's not my water table. I just do it because it, I know it can be done. We have people, uh, a few resource persons who are very knowledgeable about water. Um, there are persons who seem to have the financial resources but are not actually connected to the common effort. They want to do an implementation of their own vision. That's another issue. I mean, you have the, the so-called the resources, but we have to agree where to spend those financial inputs. And everybody has to agree. It's not only what I see, what is necessary, it's the whole community. And that, that there are opportunities, but they have not yet, how, how would I say, they, they have not yet come to their full potential. In a team together, I think we would make a step forward and we would realize an opportunity that is there, but that is not able to come on the tracks, on the train tracks.
If you, if you look around in the community, we have all the possibilities, but again, what is hampering, what is delaying, what is blocking, is that, you know, let's agree on it. It's like in Holland, I had a ditch, and it was my duty every half year to clean the ditch on my side of the land. That means take out the water plants, take out the mud. If I uh, didn't do it, they gave me a warning. If uh, I still didn't do it, they did it for me and they sent me the bill. So that is a really strong <laughs> signal. And if people f feel the pain in their wallet, they will listen. The same with water. Once you have no water, then you become desperate. You, you have to see uh, human development in its integrity, in, in, a, in a total way, of which water is a part. So if you, if you think about human unity, then, then water, of course, has to play a big part. And people have to come to an understanding why you know, water is needed. And in Orville, more than anything else, water is there to sustain what is already there and sustain even more for the future. And, uh, and it definitely can't sustain, you know, like 50,000 people like in that, that crazy master plan. But if you, if you take that away, if you take that, you know, master plan, city area, all that stuff away, and, you, and your cycle is a bit larger, then you see that a lot of things make a lot more sense and that you already in the villages you have 10, tens of thousands of people. And if these people are integrated in a future development plan of Oroville, then we can actually talk about the future. If we don't integrate uh, the villagers, their life, their aspirations, their sentiments, then, you know, who are we? No, it's, it's not... Uh, it's not my dream. I mean, water is something universal. And uh, the thing is that we can only try to, to make people aware. We have to be a lot more humble and, uh, and relate to each other. I mean, be between Norwegians and also between the, the local villagers, etc. And, uh, and see that, that, you know, I mean, we are, we are not different. We are just, you know, we are coming from a different background. We come here for a specific reason, which maybe at the beginning most of us didn't even know why we were here. I think that's the main, the main challenge. It's about coordinating, it's about working together, it's about recognising the situation we're in and the situation we face and putting aside the personal things, putting aside the human things, reflecting and moving forward positively. I think the Citizens Assembly process is a good place to start to bring the information together, the different stakeholders, and try and get to a common vision. Um, we need that in Oroville. Beyond that, for implementation, I see a need for a collaboration, something probably quite formal in some sense, that the community can hold that group accountable. They take responsibility themselves, but they also say, we need your help here. We need you to get organized. We need you to come to the table. Um, and we need this to happen quite soon, that's my feeling. It could be that a really functional TDC or Lavinia could take up that role and could coordinate it. It could be that a much more organic thing that comes from the different people who are ready to, to engage collectively. Um, but somehow the community has to engage itself consciously, it has to wake up, face the challenge that we have and we'll, we'll, we will have in future. That needs a, a really uh, a will from the governing bodies of Oroville and then probably also fundraising to do it. Already long ago I suggested that each new building that's going to be built should have 10% of the price for rainwater harvesting. That time it was still the construction group, now it's Lavanier. Many have been coming and going, but Still, that is not implemented, though it was a law of Tamil Nadu. I still don't know if that is still implemented, but Jailalita 
said every house needs a rainwater harvesting. I think it has to come from Lavenir, from the governing uh, bodies of Oroville. They have to uh, address it maybe with uh, Tamil Nadu government. Some said it was my enthusiasm, others said Kirit your speedy. But I felt if I don't do it now, it won't, uh, won't be possible. And that is true because that time when I started, uh, also financially, it was much cheaper. If I would have to build it now, it would have been in the cross, which I would have been unable to, uh, to realize. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you just have to push through and do it. <laughs> it happens with small steps. <laughs> If you shoot immediately to the big picture, and uh, that's nice to keep in front of you, but I think it starts with very tiny, small steps, and keeping those steps on track. And that's not an easy thing for all of us, because we get tired of the repetitions, the, um, the, the things that it's, you know, often boring very often boring and you have to keep going and make sure that you don't lose your uh, hope, your faith, your, uh, your enthusiasm and things like that. So that's important. Small steps first. They all have to come together. All initiatives help. All initiatives. Some fade out because they were obviously not on the right they, they didn't have the right ingredients. You know, our pro one of the main problems in our community is that we have individuals who see where we have to go, what we have to do, who have the maturity. The problem is, as soon as we come together with a large group, we are kind of, there is kind of a <coughs> A force that, instead of helping us to come together, uh, puts all the difficulties in front and instead of agreeing, we fight, we shout, we, uh, we are not able to make that link between um, the individuals who do sincere efforts and then the group who is not able to make a common agreement. It's, it's needed, it's needed. So in absence of that link, which is really missing, um, and it becomes more and more clear, what happens is that individuals take the lead and <coughs> propose their individual efforts, thoughts, schemes, dreams to the community. Or groups. But this is not what we want to achieve. There are mid, as an individual, you have a very limited view. A group is focused either just in water, but doesn't have an overview of the energy, doesn't have an overview of the economics of the business things, and missing, missing things. So, <coughs> We have to make sure that when we propose something, that all the aspects, all the facets, all the colors of the rainbow are there. And that um, could, be, could be something where um, the citizen assembly um, contributes to make it in a diverse group to make an awareness about the necessity of moving together. It's what we miss is, you know, feeling that we have to move together forward. This is essential, this is essential, and it's missing in the community. It is known what, how much water is falling on the Orville Plateau and it is known approximately how much water is being absorbed and how much is running off and what we can do with that quantity of water and it is also known how many aquifers we have, whether these aquifers are depleted or whether they're being recharged. All these questions, they have been asked and the answers have been given. 
And then the answer that is being given shows that there is more depletion of the aquifers than there is recharge. And so on and so forth. If we, if we take another step and have another vision that includes, like I earlier said, the village areas and the villagers themselves, then we are talking about a totally different uh, ball game. Then automatically the water is being divided, the water is being used, and everybody sees whether there is enough water or not. Uh, in my opinion, the entire outlook of people in Orville and the, the connection with our surrounding has to be different. In a way, you, you, can, you can take a pot of water and you can use it for everything that you want to discuss. The most important is to be grateful that we still have the water. Because without that one, we would not be able to do it. And we... That's the first step. Being conscious about the water is still there, <coughs> and that, you know, we can use it. And then the next step, the key word is, let's use it efficiently. Let's use it in a way that we are conscious about it. Let's not waste it. <coughs> let's recycle it. Let's make use of it. In integral, and uh, this mostly try the rainwater uh, catch it from the roof. In the forest it is easy enough, but that might not be enough. Um, thanks to the green belters and all the work that has been done, Oroville has become a sponge. So when you have a normal rain, it goes easily in, but it is all spread out. In order to reach certain points in the aquifer, it needs to be accumulated. You need some big water holes like uh, in Nine Palms, uh, the, the Kolam, uh, Oro Dam. And there it accumulates and hopefully there it recharges. Now we are in the bureaucratic period and the supramental is still far away. <laughs> it's more difficult. In one way it's good that things are more organized, but some initiatives, if, if it comes, then you have immediately a lot of objections and yeah, <laughs> we talk and we talk, but we don't do so much, unfortunately. Let's try not to run out of water. Let's take steps to make sure we don't run out of water. Um, let's live and deliver on the ideals that Oroville was created for. Let's stay awake. Let's recognise the severity of the situation we're in and the ones that will face us. And let's do it joyfully. Let's do it in community. Let's do it together. And then let's make it happen. We have to, we have to do something soon.